Lawrence Hodge keeps dropping some big hints about what Mullen Automotive could have coming for it. What could he possibly be talking about here though? Hi again everyone, I hope you're all doing well. Take a moment, take a deep breath. That was a tough finish to the week. Um, what a roller coaster! It was like we finally got compliance with the Nasdaq again, and then on Thursday when we thought we might see a big short squeeze, uh, instead it's like someone kicked us in the nuts. And then on Friday, while we were still bent over trying to catch our breath, someone took a sledgehammer and smashed us across the back of the head. Sounds very WWF sort of style. We could probably watch the movements of the stock through the week and throw some good old JR commentary on top. Anyway, enough of that. So just looking back on Friday, obviously the stock finished the day 12 cents in the red at $1.07, which was a 10% decline over Thursday session. Uh, the stock also went down a further two cents in the aftermarket. Um, it's obviously bear season and we have not got enough traps to stop them all. This sell-off on Friday now actually represents, when adjusting for the reverse stock split, um, a new all-time low for the stock. So, tough stuff to swallow. Anyway, um, one of the things obviously pushing the stock down is the heavy short interest that's going around. And, you know, currently on Fintel, 305% of the free float is shorted. Uh, you know, obviously part of that takes into account, like, the, you know, the trading of shorts through the day. Um, and, again, there are zero shares available for shorting at present. So, there's still, like, persisting a strong short squeeze potential in the stock. We just need some... Um, you know, some real uh, confidence to come from the bull side. Anyway, the borrow fee dropped off quite a bit yesterday. It fell from 179% to 121%. This represents, obviously, the growing buffer that shorts have to cover their positions, both in average days to cover and the falling price. Uh, so what was kind of comforting is the stock resisted the psychological price point of $1 per share. Uh, that would hold up for a lot of other stocks, but, you know, it is scary at the... Stock is back close to that one dollar mark, uh, which kind of is where Mullen got in all the mess to start with. Uh, you know, with the Nasdaq delisting pressure, so hopefully it can kind of get a bit of a meaningful rally from there. Okay, so we have been stuck in this again Nasdaq compliant world without any meaningful catalyst, um, and this is kind of what's pulling the stock down. And like we mentioned yesterday, there have been corners of the press who have had the knives out with talks about the company going bankrupt. Um, you know, we sort of spoke about this yesterday, you know, like the company's not necessarily going bankrupt, even though the, there's some concerns about how much cash they have on hand to fulfill their operations. They've always now got the option of selling more shares because they can have up to $5 billion, um sold or, you know, going around. And right now they've got like something like $170 million or something or $270 million shares going around. It's not many. Um, just look at the market cap and, you know, that's like the, for every dollar now basically is one share. So it's pretty easy to work out how many shares are in uh, roughly... Uh, being circulated. Uh, anyway, so anyway, back to the callous. Who do Mullen fans turn to when they're looking for some good news? These days, we turn to Lawrence Hodge, and he has been in fine form again on Facebook lately. Uh, so yesterday, he put up two new posts. Uh, one of them was a video clip from um, the business coaching world, which is all about mentality, and I'm not really going to go bother getting into it with this video. Um, but he did put out another one, which dropped a lot of catalyst hints um, and I'll read out the second post if you haven't seen it and I'll put it on the screen so just bear with me if you have read it but um, he goes hello everyone I would like to thank all of my friends family and supporters uh, although I cannot speak on Mullen presently directly until we work out some final details of our agreement I can speak as a CEO of CEO of our joint venture I'm putting all of the wondering to rest today there will be multiple multiple I'm repeating that deals coming out of the Middle East this month in addition, some major announcements with a major international automotive company as well in another region of the world. Um, I don't speak about all of the companies that have expressed interest in our technology. My motto is, if it isn't in writing, it doesn't exist. My team has been working tirelessly in the Middle East and other countries. I am so proud and you all will be so proud of me as well. I have been 300% honest and truthful about my progress and will never lie to anyone. All I ask is that everyone keep me in prayer. It takes a strong man to be able to handle the good with the bad. There are those who want to see us fail. Therefore, I'll make announcements after the fact to keep people from trying to sabotage our deals. You have no idea what goes on behind the scenes. Everyone isn't happy about me changing the world. I will never turn back. Too many people believe in me and support 
what I am doing. Have a great weekend. I got this forever humble. So it's quite a long one for his standards. And, you know, obviously for someone not wanting to be on social media and leaving Mullen to make all the announcements from here, he sure has a way of doing things. Anyway, regarding his consistency, I think another channel, Financial Journey, hit this one really on the head. He goes, Mullen follows like Lawrence. He's a great person and he gives information about what's going on. But he is a bit inconsistent and this ultimately seems to hurt the company as investors and even speculators are looking for hard facts that they can um, put their money behind. Also, I think the way he writes and wears his heart on his sleeve makes him actually come across a little insecure, which, you know, he's obviously passionate and that's what it is. But it's not something you want to really see from a senior member of a management team. Um, it just probably isn't the best look. Uh, so, you know, if he could perhaps even be a bit more like factual in his postings, it might actually you know, help with the message he's trying to curate. Uh, anyway, so what was interesting is that he hints at there being multiple deals coming out of the Middle East. Great. Um, is this where the $10 billion figure comes from that he alluded to and covered up his tracks on? Um, or is the $10 billion supposed to be a series of deals? Um, or are these deals going to be additional to the $10 billion? Um, obviously, these are all big numbers and, you know, I'm sure the Marlin community would be happy with any of them, um, particularly if they're going to add up to $10 billion. But, you know, it's still, these are just like kind of words at the moment. We're just, we're kind of being teased and having like these little things dangled above our heads. Um, I, I kind of had a bit of a joke the, to myself a little bit earlier when I read this. I thought like, you know, maybe the Middle East members of OPEC are going to pay $10 billion to buy the patents and put the business to rest so they can keep their oil money coming in. Um, you know, if dealing with Saudi Arabia, we're dealing with the public investment fund, which gets all of its money from selling oil to the rest of the world. <laughs> you know, um, I guess, you know, if they can control the technology, which is going to, you know, eventually replace it, you know, that's not a bad strategy, but, you know, in the interim, you know, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in 10 years time. So, you know, <laughs> you could just buy it and destroy this company. Uh, I don't think that's the case. I think they are kind of trying to um, really, you know, diversify into that electric uh, that EV scene and, you know, renewable energy scenes because they see the lifeline of oil potentially having um, its end eventually. I don't think it's going to be as soon as people think or would like, but, yeah, it's going to – we'll move away from oil eventually. Um, anyway, so the other interesting point is that Lawrence Hodge mentioned a major deal coming out with a major international automotive company. So my immediate thoughts when I read this was Foxconn, and which was very funny. So I watched Financial Journey quite a bit. He's like a great person that covers this story. Um, he covers Mullen really well. Um, and he sort of said the same thing. And it was like, when I read like, oh, Foxconn. And at the moment, you know, if you look at what's going on with Foxconn, they're trying to distance themselves from Lordstown Motors while still having some exposure to the EV scene. Um, interestingly, uh, if they can get out of the Lordstown Motors uh, deal, they would have fleeced them of their production plan. And, you know, I think that company's going to be probably left for dead. Um, but I'm not 100% sure though whether it will be Foxconn. Um, obviously, there's a lot of potential options out there. Um, their approach to EVs was more so that they wanted to be a partner with production facilities. Um, so the the deal with when they bought into Lordstown was that they would help Lordstown free up their cash position by paying them cash for the facility. And so that gave Lordstown enough money to keep their operations going. And then they also bought a chunk of equity in the company. But they also have some milestones, which they're debating about now, whether or not Lordstown has failed to do it to meet their side of a deal, i.e. with their stock price. Anyway, not enough story. But, um, and anyway, Foxconn's plan was to obviously um, partner with other companies too and use the production facility and perhaps eventually more to make vehicles. Now, Marlin actually already have their own production facility. So this is one thing that makes me think that maybe Foxconn uh, might not be the deal. Um, it could be, I don't know. Um, but Foxconn's real plays, like, they're very much like a manufacturing uh, business, you know, they the ones who assemble all the iPhones that we use in the world, for instance, and stuff like that, pretty much. So um, it could be. Uh, now, I know, obviously, the, the he said it's come from another part of the world, uh, but the other, and this option, which I'm about to say, doesn't make much sense because of that criteria, but um, it could be, I wouldn't be surprised if through all this, we actually see Lucid Group um, be somewhere in the mix. So given that the company is majority owned by the Saudi PIF, they own 60% of Lucid stock, and Mullen is doing supposedly big business with the Saudis at the moment, a partnership between the two companies isn't totally unfeasible. And it could be an investment deal um, 
by the Saudi PIF that connects all these pieces together. So hypothetically, if the PIF um, want to, so hypothetically, if the PIF was to get exposure to Mullen, it means they would now have access to an investment exposure in some of the lower range EV vehicles, as well as the commercial vehicles that Mullen is, um, you know, building their business around. So this would obviously complement and not compete with the luxury market that their main EV investment, i.e. Lucid, competes in. So there is a little bit of a like a way that the Saudis could be actually looking to get a wider piece of the market with this one. Um, of course, this is all speculation, and obviously I don't think that the major automotive business is necessarily going to be Lucid because Lawrence Hodge has said it's coming from different parts. Although Lucid is technically an American company. They're just majority owned by um, the Saudis. Uh, so this is all speculation. There's literally hundreds of other automotive companies around the world that this could be um, alluding to. And generally, most of them are kind of global. Um, you do obviously get a few regional ones, but you know, as the world's become increasingly globalized, the automotive companies we have, have be who have survived have become more globalized too. So yeah, it could be any one of a number of companies anyway. Uh, but again, I guess it's kind of that hallmark of Lawrence Hodge. He kind of dangles a carrot, but um, it's more sort of like the... The shadow of a carrot. We can see the shadow. We can't see the actual carrot. I don't know what I'm going with here anyway. But it's like we're not we're not getting too much. So I don't think this is going to like be anything that's going to move the stock. But it's it's promising a lot. Um, but we're still yet to see anything really be delivered here. Um, the only thing we've had properly delivered from Lawrence Hard really is that six hundred eighty thousand dollar trial contract with the DC government. Um, so it's still very early days for him. But he's promising big things. I hope he can deliver. Uh, yeah, anyway, um, I won't go on anymore. I've, I've obviously ranted a bit here. It's the weekend. We can take a bit more time, I suppose. Um, yeah, anyway, let me know your thoughts on Lawrence's latest, uh, thoughts. Do you think Foxconn is coming? Do you think there is any potential Saudi PRF connection with Lucid Group coming through all of this? Um, do you think this is all smoke and mirrors and nothing's going to really happen? What are you, where's the stuff going? Tell me, tell me all your thoughts on my little move. Let me know in the comments below. Um, until next time, everyone, may the markets train your favor. Cheers.